here we have a packed agenda as always so let's not uh, wait too long i see people are joining but i think let's let's kick it off so thanks everyone again for joining today the june edition of the data science and aws webinar meetup um, we've expanded as you've probably seen in the title so it's not just data science on aws we're covering also a lot of the generative ai topics which is super exciting um, today, we actually have a, a quite nice mix. I'm also super happy to welcome Suman. Um, Suman is actually um, a colleague of mine um, here at AWS as well, and uh, principal developer advocate for data engineering. And he'll talk about here in a minute um, how to get started with Polars. So some of you might heard about it. Um, it's a, a new library, open source data frame library. And I think Suman is gonna show us how fast it actually is. <laughs> so there has been a lot of hype about it. And I'm actually personally super, super curious to see it in action. Suman will also have a demo. Um, so thanks Suman for joining us today. And then Chris will um, take the second slot today and deep dive a little bit more into the generative AI discussion. We had a, a quick lightning talk last month webinar where he kind of introduced the concepts around parameter efficient fine tuning and reinforcement learning from human feedback. So today he'll actually expand a little bit on that and pass the whole second slot to talk you through what the concepts are. And also I think show a little bit of code, of course, um, how you can get started with the topics. Anything else to add here, Chris, before I hand it over to Suman? No, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, what do we have lined up for next month, Ancha? Uh, we're just finalizing that and going to oh, share still, soon. Okay. Okay. Yeah, cool. So, yeah. Perfect. And I haven't seen Suman since he and I worked on the same team. All three of us were on the same team. And uh, now Suman's on a different, or, or, yeah, no, Suman left and then came back. And I'm on a different team and have yet to come back. But we've all worked with each other. And, uh, yeah, very excited to see you again, Suman. Yeah. All right. And, and with that, I'll stop my screen share and hand it over to you, Suman. Take it away. Sure. Thank you so much, Anshia and Chris. So let me know if you are able to see my screen. Yes, I can see the slides. OK, perfect. Yeah. Let me put that in slideshow. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. And uh, uh, this is something that I've been exploring for the last couple of months. and. Uh, I got very excited because most of the time I spent um, working on Spark. Uh, and when I first learned about Polars and when I first listened about that from, uh, from one of the broadcasts, uh, I thought that this is something really interesting. So I just thought to uh, share a few of my learning in the last couple of months. And this is something that I have done. Um, I, I've presented at uh, PyCon Italy uh, last month, and uh, we are going to present this at a few of the other uh, PyCon in the upcoming days in this year. So what we are going to do in next 20, 30 minutes is we'll try to learn about what Polars is at a very high level and why uh, you, know, you should try it if you are into data science and data engineering field. And uh, how you can get started and i'm going to share you a few of the uh, github repo which has uh, you know tons of uh, examples notebooks which you can try out uh, whenever you get time okay so with that uh, let's get started so the first thing that comes uh, uh, to our mind uh, when we think about polars is uh, it's fast uh, now we will try to learn uh, why it is fast and uh, uh, you know how can we quantify uh, uh, this swiftness or how fast this is because performance is always relative. So rather than me showing you how fast this is with respect to other data frames or other libraries, it is always good to uh, try it on your data set and see it uh, of your own. But uh, just a few stat which uh, I just pulled from their website. This is an TPCH benchmark, which is typically used for the sequential as well as uh, 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 random workload for databases uh, typically. And if you see, um, uh, this test was uh, executed on, I think, 10 more than 10 millions of row and nine columns, roughly around 5 GB of data. And you can see that, uh, you know, Polars uh, could do those operations in 59 seconds, whereas other libraries uh, like Pandas is almost 1,090 uh, seconds. So 
And in this chart, if you see uh, the purple one, which is almost uh, touching the uh, x-axis, uh, that is the performance uh, that Polars can give you. Now, we have many data frames uh, uh, in, in our open source ecosystem. We have Dask, we have uh, Pandas, obviously, and we have Modern, which, is, uh, uh, which makes Pandas uh, distributed across the systems. And then we have uh, Rapids as well, if you want to make use of uh, GPUs. And then we have Spark, if you want to make use of uh, the computation across the system, uh, not within one computer, then you can make use of uh, uh, Spark. Now, there are different frameworks uh, that we have. Now, why are Polars? So now, if you think about Polars, what it is at its core is it's a data manipulation analysis uh, library. And you can, if you are coming from uh, Pandas background, you can think of this as an alternative to uh, Pandas. Uh, and what makes this special is uh, it's uh, written in uh, Rust, which uh, makes it uh, uh, very dynamic, uh, especially in the uh, garbage collection and the memory optimization because of the language uh, itself. And uh, one of the key thing of Polars is uh, it is uh, very memory efficient. And we will touch base on that, you know, why uh, we are saying that it is memory efficient. And it uses... Uh, uh, Apache Arrow uh, 2, uh, the Rust implementation. So that's a native implementation that has been taken uh, uh, by Polars. So that also means that the libraries which uses um, Py Arrow uh, under the hood uh, can make use of uh, Polars. So if let's say you are using Polars, which is built on top of uh, uh, Apache Pi Arrow. And now let's say you have Spark, which also let's say uses uh, Apache Arrow. So you don't, there is a nice interoperability between uh, two higher level APIs. So you don't have to you know, copy the whole data under the hood in case you want to transfer the data or in case you want to manipulate the data across different uh, libraries. So that interoperability you get because of the Apache Arrow uh, under the hood. Uh, the other thing is it has an expressive API. And again, I'll uh, talk more about what this means um, with example. Now, apart from all of this, the key features are it has an expressive API. Um, it it makes use of all the cores in your computer or in your server to execute any operation. Uh, unlike, let's say, uh, Pandas, which is mostly skewed towards one of the cores. So the, you, you don't get that much of uh, you know, uh, uh, parallel execution uh, with the native Pandas. Although we have some additional uh, modules now, which kind of makes Pandas parallel, but uh, it is not uh, natively. But Polars is natively uh, parallel. And one of the uh, interesting thing about uh, Polars, which actually makes makes it very fast is the lazy execution. So, uh, and this is what uh, I will explain in the demo, uh, which will make more sense, uh, you know, rather than talking um, dry here. All right, so now when we think about swiftness or uh, 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 performance, one way that we can execute our code fast is by making use of our hardware efficiently. So let's say if you have a system with multiple cores and GPUs, now, if we are not making use of all the cores without parallel, uh, parallelization, we won't get the best out of it, right? So this is what typically happens in the modules like uh, uh, Pandas. Now, what we want is we want to uh, make things parallel. And there are a few modules uh, uh, like uh, we have Dask and all of that, which can, uh, and Modern, which can make things better, but it cannot go beyond that. So we need to make sure that we uh, parallelize our operation in the right way, right? So it's not like uh, just hiding the drawbacks and uh, putting the sugar on top of it to make it work uh, to some extent. So the way that uh, we get uh, parallelization in Polars is in different ways. So the very basic, at its very core, let's say you have a data like this. Uh, we have some uh, column X and Y, and let's say you want to do some group by operation. So one simple way to do this is we split the data uh, and then 
uh, we just apply the transformation in all the groups of data, uh, you know, separately. So all this operation can happen uh, in parallel. But the condition for this is uh, we should not have uh, same key in two different partitions, right? So if that is not the case, then we can simply use a native map reduce kind of uh, task where we just split the data and then we perform some, uh, uh, you know, uh, apply operation or we just do some uh, reduce operation and then we just combine that. And this this works well, um, but the condition is uh, the all the keys should be separate uh, in all the different workers. But that is not the case in in the real world. But whenever this happens, Polars will make use of this, uh, you know, splitting the data and applying the transformation. So that is a very straightforward way to uh, uh, get uh, parallelization. But this is not idle in the in the real world. So in real world, the data would be mixed. So uh, assume that you have the same data, and now what you can do is you can take the first half of the data and send it to thread zero, and the second half of the data send it to thread one. So here you can consider thread zero as CPU zero and thread one as CPU one, and then you try to do the uh, uh, you know join operate uh, group by operation within uh, uh, each uh, thread independently. And this also works, but there is a condition that uh, if you have the same key in both the threads, you need to have uh, uh, some mechanism so that uh, you know both the threads can talk to each other and you should have uh, the locking and synchronization in place. Uh, because the grouping of this uh, thread zero and grouping of uh, uh, thread one uh, is not the result that we are looking for, right? So because we have the same key. So to mitigate that, we can have some, some sort of hashing in uh, all the threads uh, so that they can talk to each other and they can uh, you know, uh, log the memory uh, whenever they are working. Well, let's say thread zero is working, so it will log the memory uh, at that point so that uh, other threads cannot uh, write other, uh, on that particular location. But this works, but this will add an uh, hindrance because of uh, intercommunication between the threads. And this will work fine if you have a four CPU core or let's say two CPU core, uh, it will work fine. But the moment you have 16 CPU core or 32 CPU core, there will be a lot of uh, messaging going on across the cores. So this is not good. And that's why uh, what Polars have implemented is uh, something called lock-free hashing. So what it actually does is it says that, okay, you give all the data to each of the CPU core. So if you have, let's say 16 CPUs, you, you give the data to all the 16 CPUs. So here we are taking an example of two CPU core, but the same uh, goes uh, with multiple uh, CPUs. Now, what it does is uh, it has a uh, hash function and a modulo function, and it will just filter out the keys which are assigned for that particular thread. So here, if, I, if you see this, we have a hash function and we are doing a modulo op operation with zero. And this zero is because let's say this is a thread zero. That's why it is zero. So for thread one, it will be uh, uh, percentage one. Similarly for thread N, it will be percentage N. So what it essentially means is each CPU core will take all the data and it will perform this hash function with the modulo. And it will just keep the data which is assigned or which is meant for that core and it will just uh, ignore the other data. So that way, you're always guaranteed that uh, a particular key will only land into uh, or will be performed by only one of the threads. Now, at the end, what you have to do is we just have to concatenate the whole data. And this works very efficiently because there is no uh, locking across uh, multiple threads or code. Now, the only drawback here is when you get the ultimate result, uh, they won't be in sequence, which is uh, still okay, because if you want uh, anything to be sorted, it's better to sort that beforehand uh, and then perform this operation. So uh, this is the only, I would say, uh, a trade-off uh, that data won't be in, in the order that you want. But if you want the data to be in order, it's better to do the ordering or sorting beforehand. So that's this is uh, what makes um, uh, Polars uh, very efficient and fast. And before we jump into the demo, I just want to show you how a data, uh, how a data engineer, or uh, especially data, especially a data engineer, uh, really work with these kind of data. So 
all they need is few of these uh, uh, verbs, like selecting few columns, creating few columns, filtering some columns, and then uh, doing some group by or join operation, and that's all, right? So the way that uh, this, this would look like in the code is something like this. You just select few columns, and then you can create a new column, then you apply the filter, then you apply the group by, and you apply the aggregation and then sorting if you need. So if you look at this syntax, it's very clean and it's very readable. And if you are coming from Spark background, this might, uh, you know, uh, this might seem very familiar. And the other thing here is each, each of this expression in all these lines, they all get executed, uh, you know, in parallel. And we are going to see that uh, in the demo. So one, one thing is, uh, to note is this library is very new and uh, it, it's still uh, getting developed every uh, passing day. So whatever is working today, tomorrow, the syntax might change, something might uh, change. So you have to make sure that um, uh, you follow the documentation. So with that, uh, let me uh, show you the, uh, let me go to the console and show you some, uh, some code, okay? So, here, what we are doing is, uh, I'll just quickly show you uh, uh, the performance part, uh, how the performance might look like. So what we are doing here is, we are importing pandas, we are importing polars, and we are also importing modern, and uh, we are just creating a client because that is needed uh, for modern to work. And now here, we are just reading a sample file uh, of New York taxi uh, data. I think this this data set is meant for data and data science community. So what we are doing here is we are just uh, reading the data, data frame using uh, polars, right? And we are using scan CSV, which is not same as reading the CSV. So scan CSV is actually uh, makes the data frame execution in, uh, in a lazy mode. For, for example, so if you say uh, pl.read, CSV and then if we if we give CSV file, so in this case we are actually reading the file at that point itself. So it's an eager way of uh, reading a file, and this is how pandas as well work. But if you say scan and hit enter, you will see that there is a nice plan. So that means Polars have not yet executed this code, but it is just waiting uh, for you to uh, perform some collect operation, which will actually uh, go and create an optimized plan and then run the code. And I'll, I'll show you some example, but uh, the only thing to emphasize at this point is there are two ways that you can uh, read a file. One is using scan CSV and another is read CSV. So scan CSV is in lazy mode and read CSV is in eager mode, which is uh, a, a default one like uh, you do in Pandas. All right, so now let's uh, try to uh, uh, read the file using Polars and see how much time it takes. So it's roughly taking 105 milliseconds. And now let's try to do this with uh, Pandas. And if you see here, it is taking roughly around 1.85 seconds. And now uh, let's say you are an informed engineer and you are very much know how to optimize your code. So now you are using Arrow's uh, engine with Pandas. And if you do that, you will see that this is still better than uh, a native Pandas, but it is still a, a way slower than Polars. And lastly, we can compare this with modern as well. And if you see this, it is 1.16. So if you compare all of these three, uh, four comparisons or uh, four different types of data frame, you see that uh, Polars is way faster with its default uh, configuration. I, I'm just reading the file. But uh, uh, even with uh, Pandas with arrows and modern, uh, we are not getting that uh, performance. Now, let me show you quickly uh, how this uh, optimized plan works. So as I just uh, mentioned that if you want to execute your code in a lazy way, you have to make use of scan CSV. So uh, to give you a very simple example, uh, let's say you have a file of 100 million rows, right? and let's say you want to just read the first five rows. So if you do read CSV, and then if you just read the first five lines, 
what you are essentially doing is you are reading the whole file into the memory and then just uh, printing out the first five lines. But in case of scanned CSV, uh, what Polars will do is it will first uh, uh, see that what operation you actually want to do. So when Polars will see that, okay, this guy is, uh, it just want first five lines. So what it will do is it will create an optimized plan and that optimized plan will say that, okay, just read or just load the five rows, first five rows uh, uh, to the memory. So that way, um, you know, you get uh, a better uh, memory footprint uh, in your system. So for, for example, if you see here, I'm here scanning uh, the CSV file uh, or rather reading the CSV file in a lazy mode and I'm doing a group by operation and uh, I just want to know the trip duration, uh, right? Maybe I want to know the mean, max and uh, um, a minimum uh, uh, duration, right? And if you see here, the way that we are accessing the columns of, uh, of the data frame is using pl.call. And this is very much similar to how you access column in Spark. Although uh, I will show you that uh, the regular square bracket indexing also works uh, here, but that, that will be surely deprecated in future, but they kept it because of uh, engineers who are coming from pandas and regular uh, data frame, they, they feel familiar, right? So, but in future, uh, surely it is going to get deprecated. So let me just execute this. And if you see this, it took around 40, uh, 64 uh, microseconds. Now, if I do the same thing with pandas, uh, we will see that uh, it is taking 1.84 seconds. Now pandas with arrows, we are doing the exact same thing, but now we are using the pi arrow engine and we see that it is 776. And let's say uh, you want to manually optimize even more. So what you can do is you take the same code as this, uh, but since we are just working with two columns uh, like passenger count and trip duration, we can just mention, just use these two columns. So here I am, uh, introducing the optimization from my side, right? So it is not like uh, a pandas is doing of its own. Uh, so if I do this, still I get um, uh, way lesser than the uh, regular uh, polars, uh, which is default. So I'm not conf configuring anything here, except the fact that I'm running the code in a lazy mode. So that's, uh, that's a benefit that uh, you get uh, with uh, uh, polars. Now, before I stop, I just have one small uh, notebook, which, which I will just run it through. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share you a GitHub repo, which would contain uh, all the code like this. So you will find part one, part two, part three like this. And under every uh, section, you will have multiple uh, notebooks. So you can go through this uh, notebook. This is part of one of the workshop that we have developed. And it will also have some exercise. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run this uh, getting started just to give you a feel of uh, uh, how uh, the syntax looks like and how this query optimization works. So the previous example, which I have shown you is mostly, um, you know, I wanted you to focus on the performance part, but now I'll just show you a few of the uh, syntactical thing. So we are using uh, Polar's uh, uh, 0.17, but I think the latest version is, uh, 0 0.18, so you may like to take the uh, uh, latest upstream. Now, we are we are just setting a few configuration, like uh, we just want Polars to just print uh, five lines. Uh, and here we are just uh, reading one CSV file, and we are just reading it using read CSV. That means this is an eager mode of execution. And we are just uh, printing the first five lines. So this is pretty similar to how we do things in Pandas world. So there is one interesting method that it has called uh, Glimpse. And what it, uh, what it prints is, uh, it prints all the columns in a row format and it will uh, give you the data uh, like this. So this is a nice way to show how your data looks like. And one thing which I missed uh, to tell you is, if you look at this, uh, output, you will see that this is very similar to a pandas uh, uh, head or pandas uh, output uh, with uh, two differences. So there is no indexing here. 
uh, so Polar doesn't have any indexing because the creator of Polar's uh, think uh, that indexing is not that needed because if you have to uh, uh, select a particular row, you mostly do that using filtering. So that's why they have not uh, you added uh, indexing. So which eventually means uh, you don't have the madness of indexing that you have in pandas like iLock, lock, and so on. So here uh, you don't have uh, any of that. Okay, so now how you can access a particular um, uh, row or column. So this is a, uh, a regular way of accessing. You give the uh, rows that you want to uh, print and the columns, and this is not recommended, but uh, this is, available. So if you are from Pandas background, so you can run the same code, but this will not give you the best of uh, pullers. So to actually make use of pullers in, in its uh, uh, right way, you should use an expression API. So this is what uh, I was referring to. So the way that uh, you can select the uh, rows is by simply use this select uh, method. So it's it, it might sound very much uh, like a SQL kind of a syntax, but what you do is you say df.select and then you just uh, mention which are the columns that you want. And the way that you select columns is using pl.call. Now, if you run this, you will get all the uh, rows for all these three columns. Now, uh, let's let's go one step beyond. And let's see what else we can do within this uh, operation. So you can not only select a particular column, but you can also perform some operation in that column at the same time. So here, what we are doing is we are taking the names column and we are uh, converting it to a uppercase. And we are taking the age column and doing some operation, like we are rounding it to the uh, second uh, decimal point. So when I enter, what happens under the hood is all these three uh, uh, expressions gets executed at the same time in parallel. Okay, so that is where uh, the speed comes in. Now let's try to do something uh, uh, something more. So we can actually keep on chaining the transformations. So here we are doing, uh, what we are doing is we are keeping the P class column, we are keeping the names column and then we are doing some operation on that names column. So let's say we are splitting the name with space and we are giving the name of that new column as name split. And then we are just counting the number of words uh, you know, in that particular list. So this is how you can chain uh, methods within an expression. And also you can add multiple expressions within the same select uh, statement. And one thing to note here is Let's say I don't give this alias. So in case I don't give this alias, uh, by default, Polars will uh, uh, you know, replace the existing column itself. So it will just have a new column. Uh, it, it will just uh, replace uh, the data uh, with the old column name. Okay? So that is, uh, that's why we always uh, give uh, alias. Now you can do uh, filtering as well. So this is how uh, Polar's author recommend us to uh, select a particular row. So we don't have that row indexing, which uh, we have in uh, Pandas. Um, but most of the time, we as a data engineer or data scientist, we would like to filter the data based on some condition. So you can easily uh, uh, filter the data uh, using the filter method. And you can, again, give whatever expression that you want. And it, here, we're just giving one condition, but you can always chain multiple uh, conditions, right? And uh, let's let's lastly see a few other operations. So this is very straightforward. Uh, describe if we have something um, in pandas as well. And value count is also we have uh, in uh, different packages like Spark. Uh, and you can, even in pandas, where you can do some counting on a particular uh, column, unique counts. Now, now let me just, uh, I think I'm already off, uh, off the hour, uh, I mean, uh, I'm shooting out of time, but I'll just quickly show you how you can uh, make use of uh, group by. So let me just show you this particular operation. Okay, so let's say 
you want to perform a group by operation, okay, and on let's say two columns, uh, let's say the people who have survived because there's a Titanic data set and uh, based on uh, the passenger class. And then what you can do is you can aggregate after group by, um, we should have some aggregation, right? Because it will return a, a, a group by object. You can perform some aggregation and then you can actually define the window of that uh, operation. So it's just like if you have if you have worked in uh, SQL, uh, this is kind of uh, a window function, right? Where you just perform uh, the aggregation based on the window that you define. So the syntax is uh, uh, very native. Like you do, uh, you create a new column, you perform some operation, and then you define over what partition it should perform that. Uh, uh, counting, and then you just give some uh, alias, right? So this is how uh, you can do a, a window operation. So lastly, I just want to show you how this query optimization uh, works. So in this case, we are using scan CSV, not the read CSV. That means this is a, a lazy data frame, and we are grouping based on these two columns, and we want the aggregation. Now, if I hit enter, you will see that we don't get the output. So what we get is we get a naive query plan. And this is what Polar says that uh, unless or until you uh, call the collect method, uh, you will not, uh, it will not perform any operation. So this is a naive uh, uh, plan. So there is no optimization here. So let's say you want to know uh, the optimized plan before even running uh, the collect method. So what you can do is you can just uh, run this method uh, called explain. And the moment you run this, it will show you the optimized plan. So if I just scroll up, you will see that this is, uh, you know, just a regular knife plan. But in the optimized plan, uh, Pol Polars have detected that this user is trying to do operation only in three columns, right? And that's why it has, in the optimized plan, it says that uh, it has projected only three columns out of 12 columns, right? So uh, that is the benefit of um, Polars. And now if you really want to execute that, um, what we can do is, uh, what we can do here is we can just say collect. And it, it is going to execute. And it's, uh, it's actually, uh, performs the optimization at all the levels. So here, let's say if I add another statement called a uh, filter, right? And if I run this, you will see that uh, this is not the optimized plan. This is the knife plan. But if I just run dot explain, you will see that it has selected only uh, four columns because there is only four columns in this query, but also it has added, since we have added a filter in the optimized plan, uh, it added this, that it is going to load only uh, age, which is greater than 50 in the memory, right? So uh, whenever you work with Polars, it's, it's always good to run this explain method to see how Polars is going to uh, optimize your code uh, when you actually uh, run, uh, you know, collect. So this is the method that you have to run uh, to make, uh, to give and pull us a green signal that, okay, now you perform your optimized uh, code, okay? So with that, uh, I'll just uh, stop here. And before this, I'm going to share you uh, the GitHub repo. So this is the GitHub repo that uh, we have, which contains all the notebook. And uh, there is another repo, which is a beautiful repo, actually. I found this uh, recently. Uh, where you will find all the resources uh, for uh, Polars. In fact, uh, that workshop details is also there uh, in this page. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I'll try to answer on the chat. And uh, I think we have lots of questions. <laughs> we do. Thanks so much, Suman. It was really, really cool to see. And I think I, I speak for, for most of us here, really impressive um, in comparison how fast Polars really is. Um, let me pick, um, I think, a few questions here to answer live, and, and then you can get to the rest um, in the chat. Um, in the beginning, you talked about trade-offs, and um, someone here pointed out, thanks for that, um, there's another trade-off to think about. You have to transfer far more data to the processors with Polars, right? 
Um, any thoughts on that, Suman? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, I also thought the same thing uh, because when you are uh, giving the data to all the cores, you, you are have you are giving more data uh, to all the cores, but uh, that is still okay because. Uh, it's, we are using uh, arrows under the hood and it is in memory. Uh, so it's very, uh, it, it's, it's quite okay to have, uh, you know, to load the data into the memory. And that's why we say that in case your data is very huge, uh, which is, which cannot be fit within the memory, Polars uh, use something called um, uh, chucking of the partition. So it will just uh, split the data into chunks and it will stream from uh, the back end to the memory. So you don't have to worry about all of that. So under the hood, uh, it will partition the data and it will stream the data uh, while it process. Okay, and then why not do the parallel hash before sending the data to the processors? Then you only transfer the data once instead of the data times processor ton of data. Uh, okay, so if I understand it uh, correctly, we, so in this, uh, in the, I think this is in, in this, uh, uh, this is the question, right? So, yeah, right. So how we, how we would know that if we have to filter, uh, you know, uh, which key, if we do that, then we are again going back uh, to this method, right? Where we are actually, uh, you know, doing that operation uh, separately. So in this case, what is happening is we are uh, just letting the data go to all the cores. Right. And since the data is in the memory itself, it is very, uh, it, it doesn't add much of an hindrance. And each core doesn't look after others' data. So there is no synchronization. So the, always the uh, inter-processor calls are very expensive because you need to have a queuing, you, you have to uh, have the uh, pointers and you have to, the, the stack goes up, right? So when you, especially when you have some recursive uh, you know, operation. So this makes it uh, uh, very efficient. Right. And then the other question around the same kind of um, area is, as you scale the data size into many terabytes and, and many processes, won't you become IO bound as you have to read large data sets many times, right? Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. So the, so the um, rule of thumb is this, um, at least is what I understand. If, if you have a huge amount of data, let's say one terabyte, two terabyte, so I don't think Polars is the right thing to do. In fact, not any of the data frame libraries that we have. In that case, you may go with um, things like Spark, where you distribute the data across multiple systems and you process it in the, into the multiple systems. But let's say you have a reasonable size and you have a reasonable memory, although uh, Polars can stream the data. It's not like if you have a memory of 32 GB, that means you can load only the data uh, which uh, whose size is less than 32 GB. It's not at all like that. You can have a 50 GB or 100 GB data, but it should be reasonable because Polars will uh, do streaming, uh, will, will do the streaming of the data from the backend. But we need to be a little sensible that uh, uh, if somebody can stream, that doesn't mean we can let them stream, let's say two terabyte of data, right? So it's, a, it, it's something that we need to decide. Okay, cool. In the interest of time, let's move on. Um, but Suman, if you could stick around and um, answer the remaining questions in the yeah, chat, I just will. make sure to switch the answer to everyone so everyone can see it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I will answer everyone now. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Suman. Really appreciate it. And with that, I am handing over the stage to Chris, who has another exciting topic, topic going into the generative AI um, field now. And I think we're going to hear from you around parameter efficient fine tuning, a new concept that emerged and RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback to That's right. the popular concepts right now being discussed in the industry. All right, take it away, Chris. I, yeah, I still can't get over that hat, Ancha. Yeah, it looks ridiculous, ridiculous right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, and I think last time, oh, and so just to be clear, I probably might go a little long, but we're going to continue uh, to record and we'll post to the YouTube channel, which uh, the link is in the chat. So if you do have to drop, uh, feel free to drop and just check back in um, to the YouTube channel. Let me close out that, close out this round. Okay. So. Um, I believe last month I gave kind of a whirlwind overview of um, 
you know, this whole space and what we're seeing, what, what our customers are, you know, asking about. Um, today, I want to dive into specifically this concept called PEFT, Parameter Efficient Fine Tuning. Uh, the other piece is going to be right below it, which is RLHF, and, and that's going to be further fine tuning uh, with the help of human feedback, trying to align with human preference. Um, and, you know, the way I describe it as kind of softening the answers, and sometimes I wish I had this on my email or my Slack, where sometimes if I'm in a grumpy mood, I'll respond. Uh, and if I had something that could soften my response sort of in real time, uh, maybe lower some of the uh, toxicity. So I'll show um, some slides here, and then we're going to jump into code as well. Uh, and we're going to share the GitHub repo for you to reproduce all of this on your own as well. So PEFT, let's see what this is. So first of all, to you know, really understand the problem here, uh, these models are getting humongous, right? And one billion parameter um, at the, the you know, small eight bit quantization requires one, one gigabyte of RAM, okay? And then as you start getting into the 16 bit or the full 32 bit, which is really the default, if, if you don't quantize, you need uh, basically four gigs of RAM to load one billion parameter model just to load it not even, you know, let alone trying to train it, um, you know, all the uh, temporary variables that are involved and um, all the activations and, you know, the optimizer state, uh, which is then another, you know, four times or, you know, yeah, even up to 12 times as much. So just to load these models, you need a massive amount of GPU memory. And to give you uh, the scale, the, the highest, memory that's available on a single GPU right now is 80 gigabyte. And that's with the latest A100, uh, which in Amazon speak is the P4DE. Uh, you have to be careful, the P4D only has 40 gig of RAM. The new H100s, which will be the P5 uh, series within AWS and you know, SageMaker, those do have the same 80 gig. Uh, and so we don't really have a whole lot of GPU memory. And this is why you either have to find some, you know, like algorithmic trick or linear algebra trick to reduce the, the size, you know, and the uh, GPU memory footprint, or you have to go to a uh, distributed cluster and then there's, you know, overhead for communication and all kinds of stuff. So, so this is the problem. Um, and typically we're dealing with models, you know, I'd say the sweet spot right now that I see is around between 50 billion and, you know, 65 billion parameters. We do see some pretty good results with 7 billion parameters and, um, you know, 13 billion and things, but we can go up as high as, you know, 175 billion um, and then even higher up to 1 trillion um, uh, like parameter models. Okay, so here's just kind of, you know, quick little uh, comparison here. So um, yeah, and so just keep in mind that the like 80 gig is the sweet spot here. That's the highest. So I kind of casually mentioned that you could do maybe an algorithmic trick or use some uh, fun linear algebra tricks to reduce the GPU memory footprint needed. So now I can start to train some of these models on a single GPU. And you know, when I say train here, by the way, this is all about fine tuning. So just to set the stage, we typically take a model that's already been pre-trained on you know, millions of like internet docs and uh, you know, Google books and basically the entire internet. Um, and the model has already learned. And so those are what's called pre-trained models. Now we're trying to fine tune on our specific domain or a specific task that we're trying to do. I think throughout this deck, I talk about uh, summarization and taking chat logs, you know, chat support logs between you and your uh, customer and, you know, being able to summarize them. Um, and so this is where PEFT comes in and, you know, people all, yes, yeah, so everyone calls it PEFT, uh, just kind of get used to it. Um, also, the most important and, and, and probably the, and, for, for sure, the most common is called LoRa, L-O-R-A. That's the very last one there. 
And so that's the one that we're going to dive into. And that, that stands for uh, low rank um, uh, adaptation. Okay, and so here's the sort of gist behind it. There's a lot of text here, uh, but let me just summarize where this like linear algebra trick comes in. So we have these transformers, right? These are neural networks. Uh, specifically, the attention mechanism is, you know, uh, probably arguably the most important part of the transformer. And these things can be, you know, massive, large, large, uh, you know, big like matrices coming in and out of these things big matrix multiplies, big uh, matrix additions. If you remember back in the day, singular value decomposition or what's called SVD, where you can decompose large matrices down to two smaller, skinnier matrices that when uh, multiplied together can approximate the much larger matrix. So that's what's happening here. So the LOR is for low rank. And so we're picking a rank, which think of that as the you know width of these skinny matrices, um, and you know this is on the order of four or eight or sixteen. These are really really tiny, and so now I can actually um, I can fine tune my massive model on a single GPU because all I'm training now or you know fine tuning uh, are just these two skinny matrices. Okay. And so that's essentially what's happening here. You know, A times B equals W. Um, we can use rank four. I think actually in my, uh, in my code, I'm using rank equals 32. Now this produces, instead of modifying the actual like LLM, right? And it's 175 billion parameters. It's only modifying just a small 10 megabyte, let's say, right? Like LoRa, uh, like adapter. So these are, you know, um, like often called adapters. And so when I'm done fine tuning, all I have is this small little, you know, 10 to maybe 20 megabyte instead. And, and that, that contains my LoRa weights, as opposed to each time I fine tune, I have to have 175 billion uh, parameters that have been modified. And so some of you might consider this freezing the model and, and that's exactly what's happening. We are freezing the 175 you know, base model and we're just tuning those you know, two smaller low rank matrices. So we do have some sort of informal, um, well, yeah, actually formal. These are you know, studied uh, scaling laws. We'll, we'll call them here. And, you know, we could see if you choose rank one, two, four, eight, 16, that really once you, you know, get up to eight, uh, there really isn't much improvement. And so this is incredible. This shows you that, you know, with a very, very small size, you could still get some, you know, pretty good metrics here. Now there's a bunch of other, so LoRa is a type of PEFT, okay? So PEFT, uh, you know, is parameter efficient fine tuning. Consider that to be the base class. There's a lot of subclasses here. Um, obviously, I spoke about LoRa just now. That's this one. You might have heard people talk about prompt tuning. Prompt tuning is not prompt engineering. And I, I'm, I'm a little pedantic about this difference because I see you know, customers misusing the term. I've even seen some like industry experts that confuse the terms. Um, and so they're, they're so prompt tuning as it is, is a way to do parameter efficient fine tuning. Now it's different than the way LoRa works. Um, and I'm, I, I don't have time to get into it, uh, but there are specific papers that describe how prompt tuning works. And prompt engineering is something totally different. Prompt engineering is where I'm just changing words, you know, uh, that I'm sending into the model to, to see if the model's gonna respond better. Prompt tuning, um, I guess would be kind of similar, except it's learning the best soft prompts, which might not even be real words. Uh, and so, yeah, prompt tuning, prefix tuning, similar concept to prompt tuning. Um, but, you know, really there's a whole spectrum of these PEF techniques, but LoRa by far is the most uh, heavily used. Um, okay, and let's get into RLHF. Let me check the time here real quick. Okay, I have about 10 minutes, but we'll go over, we'll you know keep recording. Yes, Ancha, are there any questions I should address before going to RLHF? 
Uh, no, let's just keep going. All right. RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback. Uh, this all kind of falls under responsible AI. The idea here is there's three H's that we're trying to optimize. We are trying to, um, uh, you know, encourage the model, you know, nudge the, the, the weights of this model to produce responses that are helpful, honest, and harmless. And you'll see Triple H mentioned all the time. Uh, some of you might remember the old wrestler Triple H uh, has nothing to do with him. Um, he doesn't even wrestle anymore, I don't think. Uh, yeah, these are you know US specific things, WWF, uh, WWE. Uh, so helpful, honest, and then harmless. And we'll, we'll specifically focus here on, on the harmlessness. Okay, so we wanna reduce harmfulness or increase harmlessness. It's kind of backwards a little bit. Uh, so one way to do this is to decrease toxicity. And, and that's the demo that we're gonna show. It's probably the number one, number two asks uh, um, RLHF uh, implementation that, that my customers have been asking for, which is, okay, we've got the model responding. Uh, to customers, however, there's a few cases where it's getting a little crazy. It's you know it, it's uh, being a little bit aggressive. How can we soften this response? And and so I'll show ways to do that here. There are uh, like other types of responsible AI things like copyright infringement, and you know um, we're seeing you know uh, like some of this uh, where uh, code that was written by someone that is not open source is being served up by these code completion tools. And so there's a lot of activity going on there, ways to reduce that. But for today, let's focus mainly on toxicity. And really, you, you have to find the right balance between all of these. But the most important thing to know is you may respond with something that's helpful, but if it's harmful, that's not always good, right? So make sure that you're not kind of over indexing on you know helpfulness and then forgetting about um, you know, the harmlessness. All right, this is a crazy slide. And what I think what I'm gonna do here is just kind of uh, quickly summarize, which is we are, so where the reinforcement learning stuff comes in is really this middle box. This middle box is where, is where you either train or you can reuse a reward model all right, so all of reinforcement learning, the first thing to look for is where's the reward model? And then you wanna look at the loss function, right? And so we'll uh, get into that here in a bit. And then also what type of uh, reinforcement learning are we doing? And the um, I'd say arguably the most common right now is what's called PPO for reinforcement learning mentioned in the bottom right there, which is um, stands for proximal policy optimization. And this is a nice balance of, you know, performance um, and, you know, does a, a pretty good job. Now, I'll say in my experience, you have to be really careful because it's really easy to mess up one line of code and you are now optimizing for harmfulness. OK, and, and uh, when I get into the code, I'll show the exact line of code that if you don't get that right, you will actually make your responses more harmful. Now, of course, you're not going to release this model into production uh, right away. You're going to run tests and everything, but it's really easy to do. Um, and so, you know, something to keep an eye out for. But the general theme here is that we are going to um, have one model that we're not going to train or, or um, right, like fine tune uh, with reinforcement learning. And that's that one's gonna continue. So all of this gets fed into PPO. So there's one model that's just gonna generate, you know, maybe it's toxic. And then there's a second model that we are going to start to make little tweaks to. And, you know, it's a slightly more complicated loss function, uh, you know, what's considered to be harmful and, and you know, not harmful. Uh, but the, the, the goal is to modify the weights such that we start to generate like a little bit more positive responses. And so I'll show in the code and some of the results here where uh, some of, of, of these responses actually with just about 10 or so uh, really quick iterations, you know, maybe five minutes of fine tuning, we can actually start to see positive outcomes coming out of this reinforcement learning. And so the the secret 
you know, really these models are so powerful these days that they're getting answers correct and they're not really hallucinating that much, you know, uh, certainly not as much as they were even just like six months ago. And now the primary focus is on making these uh, responses less harmful, more helpful, and yeah, obviously more honest. So a lot of time being spent these days, I mean, I've seen this over the last six months, even just with, with my individual customers, where in the beginning, we were just trying to get these things to work. Now that we have them working, now we're we are, you know, starting to tune them on our domain information fine tuning, which is what I had mentioned right before with PEFT, and they're almost all using PEFT and LoRa, and now they're at the phase just, just like literally in like the last couple months, where they're now trying to soften up these answers and um, make them more human-like. Okay, so just you know, stepping back a little bit, what in order to create a reward model, right? So if I go back here, that's really this like middle section. In order to create the reward model, we need humans to come in and say which answers are toxic and which ones are not and start to rank them. And so, you know, here's an example. This is actually out of, I believe the open AI paper um, on how they went about RLHF and, you know, training reward models. Uh, and so, this gives you, so this is what the human labeler, uh, you know, th this is part of, of the instructions that the human labeler has been given. Uh, and so there's things like, if you see two responses are similar, then rank them the same. There's no reason to force one into, you know, higher, better or not. It's actually useful information to say, you know, these two responses. So uh, stepping back one uh, second, you know, um, the labeler, sees, for example, a question, and they're presented with four or five different answers. And all of those answers look on the surface to be the same, but some of them might be a little bit more harmful than others. And so the human then ranks and says, this answer um, is, a, is a little bit better, it's, it's a little bit softer, and they can actually rank those answers one through five for that same question. And so, and you know, these are some of the guidelines. Uh, and so, you know, here's an example using, for example, SageMaker Ground Truth. And this is, you know, one of our, our uh, like product offerings here, our services that let you, um, you know, rank. So here's a sample question. I just made this up because Ancha is from Germany. Uh, and I say, who is Angela Merkel's favorite US president? And I offer, uh, two examples. So here, this is not actually harmless and harmfulness. This is more about, you know, helpfulness and like honesty. Um, and the answer, of course, as uh, many of us know, uh, yeah, Angela Merkel always kind of had a thing with Barack Obama, the U.S. president. Uh, George Clinton actually is not even a president. He's a, uh, you know, performer, artist. Um, so the and so here's where we're ranking. I'm saying George Clinton is, is, is a low ranking answer to this question and Barack Obama is a high ranking. Now I could have four or five of these and it would be ranked one, two, three, four, five. Um, I just kept it simple here. Now those answers get stored into S3 in a, in a, a, a specific format. And then it takes a little bit of code, just you know, pandas magic, a little spark magic to actually convert into the reward. So here we see the question, we see the answer, we see the relative ranking, right? So this could be one through five or something if I had you know more than just low and high. And then ultimately one of these is given the reward. And so we see Barack Obama response is given the reward and all of the others are given no reward. And that's where everything comes together and reinforcement learning is being used. Okay, well, that's just another example here. Um, <clears throat> I do want to mention this KL divergence because you will almost always read about it or see a, a footnote. This is a very, very complicated diagram here. Um, just know that earlier when I mentioned we have one model that's not changing and we have a second model that is going to change with these rewards. And the idea there is that we don't want the uh, second model, which is changing, to, to get 
to stray too far from what the original model would have uh, generated. Okay, and so KL divergence, think of it like it's always kind of pulling the responses back to what they would have been originally, but with a little bit of softening towards the reward, right? Because otherwise what's gonna happen is uh, the, you'll, you'll, you will start to see what's called reward hacking. And the second model that's being modified could start to generate crazy things that while it satisfies and makes the reward model happy, it's not actually uh, you know, generating responses that are similar to what the original model would have generated. So it just, you know, so like KL divergence, just like you would see it in other statistical forms is constantly, it's comparing two distributions and it's constantly pulling it back making sure that things don't diverge too far. That's the intuition there. Uh, what's this here? Okay. And the cool thing is I can continue to perform RLHF. Now, I will warn you, RLHF is a bit of an expensive operation. Uh, it's, it's not as, um, I'd say, you know, uh, well, it's not as fast as just sort of regular, you know, there's a, a slightly more complicated loss function and um, it's still using a form of cross entropy and, but there's a little bit more calculation going on. So uh, the short of it is you can use PEFT also with your PPO. Okay, so with reinforcement learning, you're using what's called PPO. That's the actual mechanism. That's the algorithm. You can combine it with LoRa, which we learned about at the beginning of my talk, and actually, uh, you know, speed things up and be able to uh, train. Uh, because at the end of the day, that second model that's being modified is what you're going to release into production. Okay, and you can, you know, generate different variants, and so. While we don't know for sure how someone like OpenAI is doing it, we do see customers who are generating multiple variants of their fine-tuned models and deploying them in parallel in production, and they're doing A-B tests, right? They're doing A, A, B, C, D, you know, up to Z tests. And so this, by the way, is very likely why if you use open AI or you're using one of these managed services for, for chat or for you know, generating completions and you know, responses to your model, this is why you will oftentimes see very different responses for the same prompt. Um, it's partially due to the fact that these models are given a little bit of freedom to generate and be creative, but it is also very likely there are, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of models that have been deployed that these um, uh, companies are comparing in production uh, in real time. And that's where you see thumbs up, thumbs down, and right, like a lot of that gets fed right back into this RLHF process and it, it continues on. Okay, Ancha, I was gonna show some code. What do you think? Yeah, I'll... I started answering questions here, but yeah, let's do a quick, maybe a quick peek into the code and then you can share the GitHub links, I think, where people yeah. can poke around, yeah. Sounds good, let me zoom in here. I know that's that's what I always ask the first thing. Um, let me just jump right to, I'm just gonna jump right to the RLHF just for time's sake. And <clears throat> here's you know where I said we're using Peft Laura with the RLHF. Okay. So if if I was not using RLHF, by the way, I would have to be making PPO uh, like gradient updates during the reinforcement learning training process to 250 million parameters. Now this is a small, this is Flan T5, by the way, this is the base version. It's only 250 million parameters. Plan T5 does go up. I think the double XL version is 11 billion parameters. Um, you know, it doesn't quite fit in the CPU that I'm using for my notebook here. I can use a GPU for my notebook, um, but in in order to make this more accessible to folks, uh, I like to stick with CPUs. Um, but when I am doing real hardcore training, of course, I, I always switch to GPUs. Everything is so much faster. 
With PEFT, I'm actually only training 1.4% of the model parameters. And, and these are uh, new model parameters that have been added that are those skinny matrices that are being placed inside of the neural network. That, and those are the only ones being tuned, okay? So instead of training all 250 million, I'm really only training 1% or 1.5%. And this is what ends up being about, I think, 10 megabytes, maybe 14 megabytes, okay? Here's where I'm setting up PPO. Now, for PPO, I use a library called TRL. And yeah, maybe Ansha, you could uh, paste in the link to TRL, uh, maybe even paste in the Hugging Face link um, to the blog post that describes TRL. Uh, and I forget, I think it's Transformer Reinforcement Learning Library or something. Uh, works really, really well with the uh, hugging face code. Um, and you'll see here that it, it just adds this extra what's called value head on top of the um, uh, transformer model. And this is really what's being, um, or uh, it's being, well, no. So, so there are two things going on here. I have the, the PPO value head. So this is the reinforcement learning part. And then I've got LoRa, uh, which I configured up here. And that's injecting new uh, parameters. And so this is the final count of parameters here, 250 million. Uh, a little bit extra detail here, but you know, just know um, that we're combining PEFT, LoRa with uh, PPO. Now, I had mentioned a, a bit ago that we've got this reference model. So I was calling it base model, I think, but this is the reference model that is not going to change. This is what's gonna be used by KL Divergence to pull that, that uh, PPO model that, that is being updated um, back into you know, close to what the model would have originally predicted, but just a little softer. Now, uh, here, instead of training my own reward model, which I do have an example of that, but uh, I found this Facebook actually ran, I believe it was a Kaggle competition, and they, they actually trained a Roberta model. So this is a much smaller model relative to, you know, the billions of parameters of these uh, tradition or these, these newer large language models. Uh, and they have trained this model to detect hate speech or not hate speech. And so now their idea of hate speech, by the way, is very extreme. So that was the point of that Kaggle competition. So sometimes it's a little bit difficult to uh, get the hate label, but just know that this is a binary classifier. That's really all it is. At the end of the day, it's predicting zero for not hate and predicting one for hate. And this is where you would get in trouble, by the way, if you accidentally uh, try to optimize for one um, instead of zero. And so I'll show where that comes in. Obviously, we want to optimize for zero, not hate. So let's just, I'm gonna kind of skip through here, but we'll see if, if, if this is a sample um, you know, response from our model. Where does that show up? Well. Um, you know, there's some logits here and all kinds of good stuff, but I like to look at the probabilities. Probability here, you know, almost 99, almost 100%. Uh, the phrase I want to kiss you comes in as not hate. That's good. Now we have, um, I, you know, some, some nasty stuff here. This was the least nasty that I could come up with that would trigger the not hate. Um, there's some pretty extreme things in this uh, particular, or, or that were used to train this model. Um, and so here we see, you know, 97% hate speech, uh, it, uh, and then about 2.5% not hate. So uh, very high probability that this is hate. So we see this is working a bit. You you can train your own classifier, um, and in some cases, what I've seen people do is is more on the sentiment side of things to just you know, positive and uh, negative and use that as the reward versus the extreme of hate and then not hate. Um, this actually came from a uh, customer that I was working with. So um, we were using uh, the like hate speech. And we ultimately are going to use that as the reward. Um, we do set up a, a evaluation metric 
Now there, so this is from Hugging Face uh, is a pip install evaluate. And there is a first class eval metric called toxicity. I'm giving it the Facebook hate speech model. And I'm saying the toxic label is hate. Uh, and so again, if, if you accidentally say the toxic label is not hate, you will be optimizing for the other way. So this is what we're going to use to, before we do the RLHF, we're going to evaluate, and then we're going to run our RL and PPO and, and train and train and soften and, um, you know, detoxify, and then we're going to measure it afterward. So let's see what we got here. So before we have a toxicity score of this 0 0.03, um, it's standard deviation 0 0.03. Um, and we're going to, this is where we actually do the PPO, PPO trainer. Here's that reference model, the one that's not going to change. Here is the model that's going to change. And this is ultimately, if this, if this model passes our test, our, you know, if we do see a statistical reduction and also qualitative uh, reduction in toxicity, then we would literally push this model into production. Okay, but I do fully encourage that you test these before pushing them into production. Um, so a lot of this, okay, here is where it's really, really easy to screw up and choose the uh, wrong index. Um, and I speak from experience because at first when I was building this code, usually one is the positive. In this particular model, one is the hate. And so by accident, I was actually making my responses more hateful. And I very quickly realized it because it's very obvious and uh, realized I, I was optimizing for the wrong thing. <clears throat> okay, afterward, it's down to 0.27. Now this, this was a very, very fast, let's see, this was um, probably about uh, two or, or no, maybe about two or three minutes of actual training. Um, and fine tuning, and we got a 15, almost 16% uh, improvement in our toxicity score, meaning we were able to detoxify. Just really quickly, you know, uh, yeah, right off the bat, this model was able to pick these up. So let's take a look at this um, qualitatively also, and we could see the reward before and the reward after. So this is um, what they call the query. Uh, this is the the task or the the prompt that I'm giving the model. I'm saying summarize this conversation. This is before detoxification, um, and this is after. So uh, things like can't, you know, I I've noticed um, the model tends to kind of soften it, uh, and we see the reward before was 1.54. The reward now. This, so this reward, by the way, is the logit. So this is not going to be between zero and one. We, we purposely keep um, the reward as, uh, you know, before the softmax. And if, if you're not following that, don't worry, just know that a higher reward is better. Here we see with just a few minutes of training, we were actually able to generate a better um, response. Okay, and so you can kind of sift through these, but you'll see uh, we do see some improvements. And again, quantitatively, we were able to see about 15% improvement. Okay, um, and so this is, you know, conversations. Uh, I loosely call them chat support, but really they're kind of all over the place. They're just general conversations. All right, and I think that's it, Ansh. Are there any questions we want to summarize? Yeah, let me jump back here on camera. Um, I just want to give a call out here. We had a long discussion around the bias and responsible AI. And it's definitely a topic none of us individually will solve here in the chat, definitely. But we all agree, I think it's, it's a very important topic. And the research community, industry, we're all discussing and, and you know, presenting best practices. So what I shared earlier is really kind of a best practice. Um, especially when you, you know, have human labelers creating the data set, as I shared, um, make sure you sample the group of human labelers as diverse across many different groups as possible. So you have different thoughts in there. Oh. And also the same prompt um, is being sent to multiple 
people. So you get, you know, a group of responses there and you can kind of average or find like one offs. Um, so I'd like to focus for now on the practitioner side, what we can do uh, when we develop those systems, when we develop the data sets to be mindful and really make sure to apply those best practices. And then obviously the community research industry as a whole, um, it's definitely a very important topic we all are working on to find ways to responsibly use those models in the future. So I definitely wanna just emphasize that. Um, a little bit more on the practical side, um, we just had a question when you talked about the path, Chris, um, if we talk about QLAR, maybe you can just share a quick thought on QLAR because we didn't have it in the slides. Oh yeah, QLAR, um, right, QLAR is, um, there's a couple differences. So the Q is quantization. And I spoke a little bit about quantization earlier. QLaura introduces a four bit quantization. Now QLaura has been added to Hugging Face. So it's super easy now to implement. Um, and the other big difference is that I mentioned Laura uh, itself focus, it is uh, targeted at the attention layers. And because that's where, when the, the folks that, that you know wrote the Laura paper did a lot of research, they found that by doing that skinny matrix uh, fanciness, the uh, like low rank adaptation was most effective with the attention layers. Q Laura actually goes even further and does all of the layers. Um, and, and now the other limitation, by the way, or, or a limitation is that Q Laura only works on GPUs. And so that's very, uh, if you're trying to do it on CPU, which, you know, um, probably uh, need to switch to GPUs anyway at this scale. Uh, but yes, there's something called a normal float 4-bit. So NF4 is a new data type that QLaura. Yeah, uh, QLaura is pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. And um, we will talk about it in an upcoming launch. Did you mention anything about that? Pancha, that we do have a secret no. launch coming up? No, oh, we have a so launch coming up. We cannot mention it yet. We okay. cannot mention it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's but, coming um, out in a in couple all, weeks. In all we'll talk about it in um, July. If you follow <laughs> us on, on the social channels, um, if you follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter, you won't miss it, I promise. Um, we'll have some more exciting content coming out that talks a lot more in detail about um, all of those concepts that we touched on today and many more. So just stay tuned for a little bit longer. Um, and we'll have some exciting news to share. Um, Chris, you shared the GitHub repo here. And yeah, we can yeah. post our LinkedIn's too, if you just wanna stay in touch with us. Yeah, and sorry about the not being able to copy. We've tried a billion times to figure out how to set that. We have to figure that out because it is kind of a lot. Um, right, but if just... you... If you yeah, click the links, um, you can copy the link out of your browser. That's the best way to do it. But... Awesome. Perfect. And let me just, yeah, you put yours in perfect. And I want to thank Suman. He, I think he answered like the whole time um, additional questions here on Polars. So thanks so much. Really, really appreciate Suman. Um, you're sticking around doing that and obviously giving a great talk today too. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. And we'll right. see you next month with an exciting uh, launch that we'll tell you about. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.